When Stacy and I were newly married in our early years, we joined a young couple's small group at our church in Ohio. And the first week that our group met, the leader explained that because the Bible did not have much to say about marriage, he would be giving his own wisdom to us. And we met week after week, and he imparted to us uh, experience gained from wisdom, uh, sorry, wisdom gained from experience. And some of it was really helpful, and um, it's good to be in a posture of humility and listen to that kind of thing. But he was really wrong. (laughs) The Bible says a lot about marriage in three different ways. The first way is that the Bible gives us the big picture for gender and marriage. It gives us a framework, a creational foundation. The second thing that the Bible does is it gives us specific, gender-targeted, gender-exemplified, and gender-accentuated commands, instructions, for how we should live as men and women, husbands and wives. And thirdly, the Bible gives us general instructions for how believers should relate to one another, which immediately become relevant for marriage. What we're going to do today in the sermon is we're going to hang out, we're going to camp out as our home base in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And what we're going to do is lay a creational foundation and link it to the second layer namely that of specific instructions given to men and women, husbands and wives, for marriage, and see how that connects. So this is sort of the legwork or the the, the groundwork for uh, priming you to take the rest of the Bible seriously when it comes to these kinds of specific instructions. Uh, I want you to imagine that you get on a spaceship and you land on a planet that's basically habitable, you can breathe the air, but when you get off the spaceship and you exit the door, uh, it takes you by surprise. The air is shocking to you. The colors are different. The atmospheric pressure is different. It smells different. The trees don't look right. There's different colors. There's two moons outside. It feels very otherworldly and strange and foreign. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. What I'm about to preach to you may sound strange, abnormal, shocking, otherworldly, And I'm okay with that. I am not here to be conformed to the world. I am a citizen of a different kingdom. I am in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he says is normal is normal. And what Christ says is strange is strange. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. I want to think my thoughts after Christ. And I do that by submitting myself as much as I can to all the particulars of Scripture. But I admit, if I heard this sermon when I was 23 years old, when I was 21 years old, when I got married, yeah, I would have been like, whoa, whoa, what? The Bible says, what? And it would have been very strange and shocking, and it would have taken me years to acclimate. So consider yourself in a community of Christians who are very gracious, who are very patient, We love you, your God loves you, and uh, you're not alone uh, in taking time to acclimate to God's atmosphere, his planet. We're going to start with Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. To be in the image of God means to be his embodied representation over the rest of creation. To be in the image of God means to be royalty, to be royal representatives. We are royal creatures in the kingdom of God's creation. That's awesome. It also means that we were made with a nature suitable for the task of imaging God on earth, of representing him royally on earth. So God has made us to be majestic creatures, has he not? Humans are awesome. We can be humble and say that. God made humanity to be majestic. In verse 27, God says, male and female, he created him, them, them. And so it, it refers back to the him that was made in God's image. So here we can infer both man and woman are made in the image of God, both collectively and individually. When you look at a man, you can say, that man is in the image of God. And a woman, you could say to her, you are made in the image of God. And it's not 50% image and 50% image. Both are completely in the image of God. And we are not androgynous, gender-neutral images. We are gendered images of God. We are not Teletubbies with different pastel superficial colors. We image God in different gendered ways. And our gender is not a mere cluster of features or attributes that collect together. So we're not on a spectrum of gender. We are categorically gendered. We are either male or female. If you're female, you are not male. And if you are male, you are not female. And God loves these distinctions, does he not? That's just what he does day one in creation. He separates light from darkness and then waters above from waters below and waters from land. And he names them and he gives them functions. God loves making these categorical distinctions. Also notice here that your womanhood or your manhood it is, is an involuntary gift. You did not ask for it, and he did not ask for your permission. And it's good. He made you. He owns you. He created you. And he gave you your gendered imaging identity. Finally, in verse 28, we see here, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over all the rest of creation. Humanity, as God's image, has been giving, given marching orders. You have a mandate. We call it the creation mandate. Your mandate is to subdue, bring order, bring dominion, to represent God in, an, in, in a royal and embodied way on earth. And your task, your job is to look at all of creation and say, wow, this earth is full of the glory of God, is it not? How fitting and suitable would it be for us to multiply, to, for us to make more babies, and for us to make more disciples of Christ, and fill the earth with obedient, faithful royalty of embodied representatives of God who image him over all the earth. That's our mandate. So in Genesis 1, we have a more zoomed out view of the creation of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2, we're going to see a zoom in. Verse 7, Moses is writing here. 
Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and he put the man, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Adam in the garden before Eve was created. Was basically functional. Was basically functional. To work and keep the garden. God, though, knows it's not good for Adam to be alone. Now, Adam has already begun the task of his God-assigned duty of exercising authority over creation. So he names things. And this isn't a mere superficial assignment of sounds to things. This is an intelligent task of an image bearer who studies and observes and categorizes, and taxonomizes. And he can undoubtedly see as he studies and names creation. By the way, this naming activity is an authoritative act. It's what someone should do when they're exercising order and dominion over creation and subduing it. Adam can undoubtedly, as he studies creation, see what we would call complementarity in two different ways. Complementarity, by the way, it means that two things are basically the same but different and fit together really well. God made complementarity to be woven in the fabric of creation, even at a general level with light and darkness. Uh, even when you go to the beach, there's just a beautiful bringing together of the soft sand and the rocks at times and then the, the beautiful smooth water. It comes together. There's a complementarity woven also in the pairing of male and female throughout creation. And when Adam looks at creation, he can undoubtedly see there's nothing out there like him. There's nothing majestic enough. There's nothing suitable or fitting enough. There's nothing good enough to be a suitable helpmate. No partner, no compliment to Adam. So, God puts Adam under general anesthesia. He takes his rib, and from the rib he makes a woman. And God brings this woman to Adam. And the first thing that Adam does when seeing woman is he erupts in poetry. He celebrates. It's admiration. It's joy. It's satisfaction. It's gratitude. Adam says, Wow, at last, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Wow, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God made Eve to be a helper fit for Adam. God has made in Eve a helper that was oriented toward Adam, 
fit for Adam, suitable to Adam, corresponding to Adam. She was to be a help to Adam as he continued his authoritative task that he had already begun of subduing creation, bringing order and dominion, of being an an image bearer. And she was undoubtedly not just superficially fitting to the task of helping Adam. All of who she was physically, socially, in temperament, in disposition, was meant to be a help and a compliment. By compliment, I mean it with an E, not with an I. Not, you look nice today, compliment. Compliment uh, is a counterpart that fits well. In the next verse, verse 24, Moses stops. It's like he breaks the fourth wall. I heard that put it this way once. And he looks straight into the camera. And he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The point of this sermon is wrapped up in this one word, therefore. This is how Adam and Eve were created. Therefore, this is what men and women should do. What is described teaches us what is prescribed. What was informs what ought to be. The Adam and Eve account is what we would call normative. Normative uh, means it should be normal, not deviated from. Not everything that's normal is normative, but everything that's normative ought to be normal. It's good. It's precedent setting. It's normal. It's good. And it's normative for a young man when exiting the household of his parents to not be dependent on them anymore, to not be under the authority in the household anyway, uh, in a local way, under his parents. Um, He is to depart, to leave, and he's to hold fast to his wife. He's not depending on his parents anymore for his car insurance. He attaches himself to Eve, to his wife. He becomes committed to her attached to her, joined at the hip, faithful, not abandoning her. He becomes one flesh with her. The way things going forward is grounded on and based on how Adam and Eve were created. So you get this? This is the pattern. Adam and Eve, therefore, Man and woman, going forward. Now, we've seen Moses do this. We're going to see now Jesus and Paul do the exact same thing. Let's look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. This is during Holy Week. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said to them, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, it's one of those logical connecting terms again. So, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, what, let me pause that again, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses has allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning... It was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. What's going on here? In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, Moses gives people, if they, he gives men who find indecency in their wife 
permission to write her a certificate of divorce and to send her away. What the Pharisees did is they took this word, indecency, and they basically blew it up to mean for any cause. And they ended up trivializing marriage. To correct their flippant and irreverent view of marriage, Jesus hearkens back to what? The original created order. What Jesus does is he takes a quotation from Genesis 1, male and female, he created them in the image of God, and a quotation from Genesis 2, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and so forth. So he takes those two passages from the creation account of Adam and Eve, and he stitches them together, representatively of the whole, and he concludes in verse 6, so they are no longer two, but one flesh, and then Jesus gives us his own extrapolated logic. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Sorry. <laughs> what therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So they reply, well, then why even have divorce? Why is it even permitted? What's going on here? And Jesus again appeals back to the original created order. Jesus says, from the beginning, it was not so. So, What's Jesus' logic? Because God himself joins a male and a female into one flesh, men ought not feel the ethical freedom to divorce their wives unless there is catastrophic adultery. And I use the term catastrophic adultery here because this, in this text, Jesus isn't thinking with the broad category of lust such that if there's a lustful glance at another woman, you've got now permission to divorce. He's thinking here about a narrow category of catastrophic adultery. Adultery, you might call it coitus. If there has not been a catastrophic adultery, to divorce your wife and remarry is itself to commit adultery. To unjustly divorce one's wife is to separate what God himself has joined together. For Jesus, the ethical priority is the original, normative, created order. Because of this, marriage is sacred and solemn and utterly serious. And to this, the disciples end up replying, then why even get married? And Jesus basically shrugs his shoulders and says, to who, if you can receive this, receive it. By the way, if you ever hear someone say, Jesus has not spoken to the issue of same-sex marriage, they are utterly wrong for two reasons. One, the apostle Paul, who spoke to the issue of homoerotic unions of same-sex uh, sexual passions, when, Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul spoke to that issue, he was doing so under the inspiration of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is an authoritative representation, a representative of Jesus Christ. And if you reject what Paul said, you reject what Jesus said. Secondly, Jesus, in his uh, extrapolating a marriage and divorce ethic here, builds it on the foundation of the Adam and Eve, male-female, one-flesh union prototype. In 2 Timothy, sorry, excuse me, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul follows in the tradition here of Moses and Jesus in making a similar extrapolation. 1 Timothy 2 verse 11, Paul says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So we should ask ourselves, why? Why must a woman, in the context of the exercise of authority and teaching over men, remain quiet? Why must she be characterized by being completely Submissive, Paul uses the term, with all submissiveness. Is this because of a specific, narrow situation? Is this a concern that's unique or exclusive to Ephesus? That's where he's writing to. Or does, something, it, does Paul have something bigger in mind? I want to stop here and give you a rule of thumb for Bible interpretation. There's a really great quote from R.C. Sproul. He says, when reading the Bible, we must let the explicit passages of Scripture clarify the implicit ones. So if you see something difficult, 
And you're tempted to uh, read between the lines or say, this must imply something. If you're tempted to do that, do not do that at the expense of what Scripture otherwise already explicitly, clearly says. Let the explicit, straightforward statements of Scripture inform the other texts which require a kind of uh, implicative reading. If you're required, if you need to read between the lines, read between the lines with what Scripture says elsewhere explicitly and do so in a harmonious way. But let Scripture have its own say. Paul gives a reason. And if you reread the text, if you're a revisionist, and you come up with a reason that Paul himself did not give, then you're, never, you're misreading the text. And you can get yourself out of a lot of trouble if you just let the explicit passages help you understand the implicit passages. So, why is a woman to remain quiet? Look at verse 13. Adam was formed first. And if we uh, switch the rhetoric here with, to keep the same logic, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Therefore, she should remain quiet with all submissiveness and not exercise authority or teach other men. What's Paul's logic? For Adam was formed first and then Eve. For Paul, the creation order of Adam and Eve is normative for questions of how men and women should relate to one another. Paul reinforces this. He reinforces this by appealing to the reversal and the violation of the creation order in verse 14. It says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So ask yourself, how did Satan approach the first marriage? Did he knock on the front door? Did Satan directly address the one first created? Did Satan address the one for whom Eve was created? Did Satan address the one from whom Eve was created? And did Satan address the one to whom Eve was presented? He did not. He inverted the creation order, and he went directly after Eve. Satan did what modern evangelical feminism does. He inverted the creation order, and he said, did God really say that? In this sense, modern evangelical feminism, that does a revisionist reading of the texts, in this sense, it is satanic. And Adam who was participating in this satanic pattern of inverting the creation order and calling God's word into question, Adam participates in this order. How? Not as one who corrects both the serpent and Eve with the word of God. <clears throat> Side note, my, my own speculation here. I think this was probably a fitting occasion for Adam to engage in a holy violence toward the serpent, not his wife, toward the serpent. He should have had himself some roast serpent. He should have gotten his knife out and cut the serpent up, even at the risk of his own being poisoned or bit. He should have gone gangbusters. He should have put himself between his wife and the serpent and gotten violent with the serpent. And he should have looked to his wife and encouraged her with the word of God. He should have nourished her and cherished her and guarded her and corrected her and directed her and taught her and refreshed her with the word of God, with the goodness of God, with the promises of God. But he did not do that. Adam was passive. He did not intervene. The Genesis account says she that he, Adam, was with her when this all went down. He listened to his wife. He followed her lead in disobeying God's word. Now, what did Adam do? Sorry, excuse me. What did God do after this all went down? Who did God go to first? God went to the one first created. 
God went to the one for whom Eve was created. God went to the one from whom Eve was created, and God went to the one to whom Eve was presented. God went to Adam as the federal head representative of his family to call to account for what went down. He told him responsible. So, Paul's logic. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Therefore, a woman should learn quietly with all submissiveness and not teach or exercise authority over a man. But if you're a good Bible student, you should stop and ask yourself, uh, this is, isn't submission a general virtue? Are not elsewhere men called to participate in authority submission dynamics? Are not men called to submit to the governing authorities? To submit to, as is appropriate, and honor their parents? As bondservants, to submit to their slave masters? In 1 Peter, to submit to every human institution? I would even say, are not men supposed to lead in displaying submission to the earthly authorities that God has put in our lives? So why would Paul zero in on woman and insist on a submissiveness here? Well, a really helpful analogy or metaphor here is to think of virtue as clothing. Right now, in this congregation, both men and women are wearing shirts. But we wear shirts very differently, don't we? They bring out different features of our frame, men and women. They're both shirts. It's a common feature of modern clothing. But we wear shirts differently as men and women. Even when my wife borrows my uh, sweatshirt in the winter, uh, late at night, I don't know, if the house is cold, she grabs a sweatshirt. She borrows one of mine. It looks differently on her. She wears it differently. She's prettier. Virtue is like clothing. The New Testament literally treats virtue or qualities or Christ-likeness like clothing. We're to put on these virtues. And both Paul and Peter teach that there are certain virtues or, or qualities that are meant to be especially exemplified or accentuated, accentuated in a gender-specific way. It's not that these virtues are unique or exclusive to one gender, but they are highlighted and exemplified and accentuated in a gender-specific way. So, Women, in this context Paul speaks of, are are to be completely submissive. On the other hand, men are to be doing what? In the church. Exercising authority and teaching. It follows that if men are to do this, there is a godly way to preach, teach, and exercise authority that God means for men to exemplify and accentuate. It's meant to be done in a manly and masculine way. Paul says in Titus 2.15, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. There's a kind of forcefulness to preaching that is exemplified in a masculine kind of preaching. Rich, as he typically occupies this pulpit, does not present himself as a feminine grandmother figure. And that's okay. Does God have a place for a feminine grandmother figure to speak into our lives as believers? Yes, to me. Absolutely, I want that. I want more of that. Please, please, speak into my life as a grandmotherly feminine figure. But the pulpit's not for that. God meant for preaching and teaching of the mixed congregation to be a masculine activity and to be done in a masculine way. Side note, if you come from a church or if you observe churches in this valley or around the U.S. adopting female preachers, I suggest to you that their male preaching has not been very masculine, that their churches have been greenhouses for the adaptation of feminine preaching. It feels like a natural fit to adopt female preachers because it doesn't sound that different from their male preachers, but it should. Moving on to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, This is verse 3. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head was shaven. 
For if a wife will not cover her head, she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. What a text, huh? Why must the headship of man be respected in the gathering of believers? Why must man present himself as a head? And why must woman present herself in a way that does not dishonor her head? Paul gives a few reasons. Look at verse 7. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Now we know elsewhere that both men and women are in the image of God. So what is the point of Paul's language of contrast here? Here's my best effort. Men and women both in the image of God, image God differently. Man images God as one who was first created. And woman images God, according to Paul here, I think conceptually, as one who is the, he says, glory of man, made from man, and created for man. God made woman in his image by taking from man who is in his image. And this order of creation, this normative order of creation in Adam and Eve is pregnant with meaning, great pun. This is an order of headship. And we see that this headship in verse 10 is a matter of authority. So why should the headship of man be respected in the gathering of believers, and why must man present himself as the head of woman? The answer, Paul gives, is that even as men and women are mutually interdependent, even as man man depends on woman, for example, in the begetting of children, Woman is the glory of man. Woman was created from man, and woman was created for man. Man images God as the head of woman. And woman images God as the one as one who is under the headship of man. And this order of headship, God the head of Christ, Paul says, Christ the head of man, and man, the head of woman, is to be honored and respected in the church. Moving to Ephesians chapter 5. So, if you didn't notice what we just did in 1 Corinthians 11, we observed how Paul extrapolated ethics, gender ethics, from the normative, ordered creation account of Adam and Eve. Lastly, our our final main text here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another Out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Pause here. In the Greek, it's like this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, to your husbands. So the verb here, submit, is borrowed from verse 21. Reasonably done so. uh, But that's what's going on in the Greek. Um, Paul is explaining himself. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What do you mean? Wives, to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he might be, sorry, that she, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. Pause there again. <clears throat> Paul quotes. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This Mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, each one of you, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Paul instructs wives to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And I, I suspect that many of us have not internalized the reality of this. <clears throat> so let me say it really uh, clearly without euphemism. Wives, you have a responsibility to obey your husbands. Your husband, short of a sinful or harmful command, has the authority to tell you what to do. Paul says, wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In what? In everything. To who? Not just any random man, to their husbands. Husbands, if you never use this authority, you are not leading well. You're not leading as you ought. If you use this authority with excessive force or for self-aggrandizement, you are also not leading well. Jesus talks about this, about a leader in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> he is a servant also. He's like a general who goes ahead of the army to be the first one into battle. He's like a CEO who takes out the trash. He's a servant. He leads, not with excessive force, not with self-aggrandizing, uh, selfish motives and agenda, but he leads. Do not neglect to lead your wives. You, husbands, have an awesome responsibility to use the authority to which your wives are obligated to obey for the health and the holiness and the nourishing of your wife for the good order and the welfare of your wife and kids, for the good of your marriages, and for the fulfillment of a greater mission that God has given your family. For this ethic, Paul appeals again to the elements of the original created order, the headship of a husband, the one flesh union of a husband and wife. And yet again, we hear in verse 31, the resounding, therefore, hearkening back to the original created order. But we learn here in this passage in Ephesians 5 that all the therefores that hearken back to the created order are pointing to something even bigger something of cosmic significance. Paul sees marriage here as depicting Christ's relationship with his own bride, 
the church. So, a wife's submission to her husband is not merely rooted in the creation order. It's meant also, also, to model Christ's relationship to the church. And a husband's self-sacrificial love for his wife is not merely rooted in the created order. It's also, it's also, and even more greatly meant to model Christ's love for his own bride, the church. He is to follow Christ's example in cleansing her, washing her with the water of the word, preparing. Husbands, you are preparing. You are preparing your wife to be presented in splendor. To give yourself up for her and to die for her if necessary. If you need to die a slow and painful death in your job for your wife, what an honor. What an honor. In conclusion, I want you to listen to the stark differences between what I'm going to call evangelical feminism, it's also popularly called egalitarianism, between that and what the Bible teaches which we can call complementarianism. In evangelical feminism, in its crystallized form, its fully orbed, developed form, there are no prescribed gender roles. This is told to me very straightforwardly by advocates of evangelical feminism. In the very words of, there are no prescribed gender roles. There are no gender roles. But the Bible clearly and straightforwardly prescribes gender roles. In feminism, there is no significance to the creation story, to the distinct roles of men and women. But the Bible gives a resounding set of therefores, hearkening back to the original created order, as normative, for gender ethics and distinct gender roles. In feminism, neither gender was created differently and suitably for the fulfillment of different gender roles. But in the Bible, each gender was created suitably and differently and beautifully for the fulfillment of their roles. In feminism, the very idea of gender roles is said to be undignified and ugly and denigrating. But the Bible, but in the Bible, gender differences and gender roles are dignifying and meaningful and beautiful and exalting. They are worth poetry and song. It's beautiful. Feminism insists that there would be no equality of dignity and value between the sexes if there were distinct gender roles. So it concludes there are none. But in the Bible, our good creator and I really do think here complementarianism is full of hope and trust of the goodness of God in the structures of creation. The Bible, in the Bible, God accomplishes the equality and dignity of value, the equality of dignity and value, through complementarity. God accomplishes the equality of dignity and value through distinct gender roles that fit well together. And finally, in feminism, the gospel is said to demand the abolishing of any notion of distinct gender roles. That's the logic of feminism today in evangelicalism. That because we have the gospel, because we have equal access to salvation, and equal benefits of salvation and forgiveness and so forth. 
that they, they reason from there, therefore, that this is the therefore of feminism, therefore, we ought not have any gender roles. But the Bible says that the gospel is beautifully displayed in the godly gendered living of men and women distinguishably depicting Christ's own relationship with the church. The gospel for a Christian who is submitting to the Bible, the gospel motivates us to double down on gender roles because we want to display the cosmic significance of the created order in men and women pointing to Christ's relationship with the church. Therefore, I exhort you, men and women of the mission church, use your God-given gender to display the gospel to the church, to the angels, to the world, to your spouse, and to your children, all to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.